You comfort those in need. You lift us high on wings like eagles. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not faint. You won't grow.
Yeah. 
Yes, Lord, you are love. We are so grateful to be loved by you. Your grace and your mercy that you bestow upon us for each and every day is all that we need. May you continue to bless us with your loving presence for us not to be led astray by the things of this world. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. You may all be seated. My name is Mike, and I'll be leading you in our time of communion. May I ask our stewards to give out the elements, please? As we continue to focus our eyes on God, let us read David's exaltation in Psalms 25, verses 8 and 9, as shown on screen. Let's all read together. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, He instructs sinners in His ways. He guides the humble in what is right, and teaches them his way. A Christian's life is, as we know, is centered on God. In the verses that we've read, we can learn that God is good and upright, meaning he is honorable and respectable. He instructs, he guides, and he teaches. We can learn from these attributes that God is active, active in transforming the lives of his people and leading the sinners and the humble to paths of righteousness. But can we all relate to this? Do we feel the need to be transformed? Or do we think that we, we don't need to? This battle between the flesh and the spirit, can we feel it in us? And if we feel it, how do we respond to it? Are we like Esau, who acted in the flesh in the moment of weakness, to satisfy his hunger in exchange for his birthright. On the contrary, if we don't feel this battle raging in us, has our heart become callous or hardened to God's instructions? We should all make sure that we do not live a double life, a shipwreck kind of life whose life is centered on the pleasures of this world rather than the pleasures of God. And this can happen to the best of us. We all want to finish well, 
but the battle with the flesh can only be won with Christ. That in our moments of weakness, He is our strength, as what Paul can attest to. Knowing that without Jesus, we cannot do anything that is innately good. So before we partake of the communion, let us humble ourselves and pray that we will be continuously transformed. Let us pray for a heart that will long for God and His righteousness, a broken spirit and a contrite heart enraged with sin, a heart that repents, that constantly repents. Let's all pray. Lord God, thank you for this time that we're able to reflect on you and on our relationship with you. May your word and your spirit continue to work mightily in us, to teach us, to rebuke us, to correct us, and to train us in your righteousness. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all eat and drink together. The, the title of my message today is Riches in Christ. And, and um, the key texts, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18, and also 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. But before we dig into the Word of God, let us pray. Father, we honor you. We thank you that your Word is a lamp and a light to our feet and to our path. We thank you, Lord God, that when we, whenever we open your Word, we hear your Spirit speaking to us, leading us, and guiding us into the right path. And this morning, as we gather our hearts together, we allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us through, your, through the power of your word. Jesus said, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide us into all truth. He will teach us all things. He will reveal to us the things to come. And it's our prayer today that as we dig into your word, that you will lead us through from beginning to the end. And may you be honored, be glorified. Our intention this morning is to lift the name of Jesus because he said that when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. Thank you, Father. We give you glory and honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the title of my message reaches in Christ. Friends, truth is the most valuable thing in the world. And the reason why we, we come here, maybe some of you um, would come here because of fellowship, but the main reason why we gather is for us to hear the word of God and to know the truth. And truth is the most valuable thing in the world. It was Winston, Winston Churchill who said, truth is the most valuable thing in the world. It is so valuable that oftentimes it is protected by bodyguard of lies. Truth is very expensive. Imagine the, the money that people spent in the court just to bring out the truth. Why? Because truth empowers people. It allows people to live a life that is free from doubt and fear. I was um, so young when I came to know Christ and I had a lot of fears. But when I started digging into the Word of God, the Word of God so clearly says we will know the truth and the truth will set us free. The more we know the truth, the more we can live with total freedom and liberty. Truth allows us to, to reach our God-given destiny. Um, knowing the truth, is, in, in fact, is the ultimate goal in life. And to, new, to know the truth about God, our Father, and the riches that God has given and entrusted to everyone who believes in Him through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that would be our ultimate goal in life. Tess, my wife, shared uh, during Father's Day about the prodigal, the, the parable of the, of the lost son, uh, better known as the parable of the prodigal son, you know, because of the um, semantic change or the change um, of the usage of words. It, the, the, the word prodigal has been um, labeled to the son, but if you will actually go through the real meaning of the word prodigal, it means extravagant, lavishly, and extremely generous. And you will find in that story, and tonight I'll be talking about the prodigal father. The prodigal son has, has got enough popularity, and tonight I'll be sharing about the prodigal father. 
because he was the real prodigal, prodigal, because he was extravagant and lavish and extremely generous in the way he deals with us, his people. You know, understanding its true and original meaning will help us understand who this God that we serve is. How much do we know about our Father? That is part of what we're going to explore today. And Robert Kiyosaki, you might read a book or heard the name. He is the author of the book, um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And it was actually a book written um, based on his own life and how he uh, reached the pinnacle of his career. He became a multimillionaire and uh, a financial guru. And it's all about the two dads in his life, his real father, and he labeled him poor dad, and the father of his best friend, rich dad, and the ways in which both men shaped his thought and life. His um, um, comments about the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, he said, the world is always handing you opportunities of a lifetime, every day of your life, but all too often we fail to see them. Kiyosaki sees one thing in common in all of us, including himself. We all have tremendous potential, and we all are blessed with gifts. Yet the one thing that holds us all, holds us back, is some degree of self-doubt. Kiyosaki, he also said, we all have tremendous potential. He also said that the following statement, the primary difference between a rich person and a poor person is how they manage fear. Uh, I still remember when um, the Lord really compelled me to prepare myself to, to get a place of our own. We've rented, we moved in, Adel in Adelaide in 1995, and for 18 years we were renting. I know it was a waste of money, but my heart is simple. Um, like as, as a believer, anything that is not eternal is eternally useless. But the Lord started to, to deal within my heart to, to look for an opportunity to buy a house, but I was so, so afraid. And when God helped me and, 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 and shared with me a few things, challenged me, I started to open open up, I started to see opportunity, and that, that opportunity to secure a place, and I was, I started from the other side of the fence into the other side of the fence, and I said, yes, it can be done, it could be done, it can happen, you just need to go through those practical things that you need to do, see, fear will always hold us back, to explore what God has for us. As a human being, the single most powerful asset we all have is our mind. If it is trained well, it can create enormous wealth. That's what he said. Because he moved from having a poor dad and understanding having a rich dad and how he had a breakthrough from his previous position to now being, you know a multi-millionaire. You know, all truth is parallel. And it's, it's, he also said, great opportunities are not seen with your naked eyes. They are seen with your heart and with your mind. You know, all truth is parallel. What happens in the natural also happens in the spiritual. And as believers, we all have these potentials and we are blessed with gifts and wonderful opportunities, but we need to break through from all our fears and see the reality of who we are in Christ. Do we really see ourselves as a person being alive, hidden in Christ? And as believers, after we have given our life to Christ, we have a new beginning, a new life in Christ. To those who are in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, to those who are in Christ, 
they are new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are new. Which means we are now under new management. We cha- he changes us from inside out, aligning us, his will or our will, into his will, and aligning us to his perfect plan in our lives. Friends, the word of God, the gospel, is not just an idea or concept to be believed, but it is a life to be lived. In Christ, our value is not determined by our valuables, nor by our net worth, but by our network, our connection. And we are connected with Christ. We are Christ's. And because of these truths, we need to um, change our worldview. We need to, to change our perspective in life. You know, the Bible encourages us to change our worldview or the way we look at the, out, out at the world by changing the way we think. We think. Romans 12, verse 2 in New Living Translation says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you, transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know when our mind is transformed, then we will learn to know God's will for you, for your servant, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You know, according to the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, as a human being, the single most powerful asset we all have is our mind. If it's trained, if it is trained well, it can create enormous wealth. Proverbs 23 says, for what man thinks in his heart, so is he. Our words and actions are the byproduct of what we think. Albert Einstein famously said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. As believers, we need to train our minds how and what to think. In Colossians chapter 1, chapter 3, verses 1 to 2, it says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on things that are on earth. Romans 8, 5, it says, For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. And which means there are two kinds of mindset or perspective that we can get into. The mind that sets its perspective on the things of God and the mind that sets its perspective on the things of man. And... In Matthew chapter 16, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they said, you know, you're the old prophet, you're Elijah who rose again from the grave, or you're John the Baptist. And, um, and Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. When Jesus personalized the question. And then on the way, in that particular chapter, they were heading towards Jerusalem. And Jesus started telling the disciples about his demise, what will happen to him. And he started saying, the Son of Man will be going to Jerusalem. The religious leaders will, will take him and kill him. And, and on the third day, he will, he will rise again. And, and Peter took him aside and rebuked him and said, that, that, that will not happen to you, Lord. And Jesus recognized the voice. He looked at Peter and said, get thee behind me, Satan. For you always think the things of men and not the things of God. In ESV translation, it says, For you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on 
the things of man. In contemporary English version, it says, Satan, get away from me. You are in my way because you think like everyone else and not like God. Friends, we should think like not like everyone else. We need to think like God. You know, there's a scripture that says, have faith in God. But the original translation of that is, have the faith of God. And what do we mean when, when we say to think like God? To think like God, we need to get into the Word of God because His Word reveals His plan, His thoughts, His heart, His will in your life and my life. You know, before coming to faith, we were so, so religious, but we were dis disconnected to God. And I was disconnected to God, although we, we, I was part of a, a religion. And be before coming to faith, I was full of doubts and fears and uncertainties. I didn't know where and how to start life, knowing that the parents were, were gone. I was young and had time, but I didn't have resources that I needed to go, to go on with, uh, with my life. And, and for the very first time, when I, when, I, when I hear the gospel, the good news, after, after hearing that the Bible is God's love letter to me, I started reading the Word of God and longing for the truth of God's Word. I started reading and learning the heart and mind and the will of God in my life. God's Word is God's love letter to you and me. And God's Word is His revelation of who the very nature and character of God that's why in John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 14, in John chapter 1, it says, And the Word became flesh. You start with the Word of God, you'll be introduced to God, and by the time you know, you experiencing the very presence of God. And if we want to know how God thinks, if we want to experience the reality of Christ, and the fulfillment of all His promises, we need to start from His Word because the most practical way to hear from God and the most practical way for us to um, hear God speaking to us is by opening our Bible. That is the most practical way to hear from God. When we open the Bible, God's Word starts speaking to us. You know, the Bible are, is our instruction manual in life. And uh, I always say, you know, the Bible is an acronym, basic instruction before living earth. And that's true. And if you want to, to succeed in life, in Joshua, chap Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, in, in New Living Translation, translation it says, Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be able uh, to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper. Only then you will prosper and succeed in all that you do. And talking about the rich dad and poor dad, I discovered about the two kinds of dads in the Bible. There's what we call the poor dad. He just wants you to become poor. And the rich dad. In John chapter 8, verse 44, here's the poor dad. It says, you are of your father the devil. And he was talking to the religious leaders. You are of your father the devil, and you will, your will is to do your father's desire. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When lies... When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and father of lies. And here's the rich dad, our God, God our Father. In Ephesians 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We are blessed with every 
spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Matthew 7 verse 11 in New King James translation. It says, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more the heavenly Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him. You know, both dads have their own plans and intentions for you. It is clearly written, spelled out in the Bible. In John chapter 10, verse 10, it says, The thief, the poor dad, wants, wants, uh, he will come to steal and kill and destroy. He just wants you to become poor. But the rich dad says there, But I come, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly they both come the question is who are you going to entertain between the white and the black cat who you feed will tell who will live or die you know what we sow in our heart and mind grows and manifests in our life and as believers we are encouraged to set our minds on things above and and to think like God because our identity is in Christ. In fact, the Word of God says, for you died and your life is hidden in Christ. So what, the, what does the Bible say about who we are in Christ? The truth of the matter is, you are rich. You are rich in Christ. Tell to that person next to you, you are rich in Christ. Yes, they are rich in Christ. Friends, when we talk about riches, we're not talking about material wealth because our value is not determined by our valuables. Our riches is determined by what, by what Christ accomplished on the cross, on our behalf. Here's what the Word of God says. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 in New um, International Version. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor, that you through His poverty you might become rich. There are only two things here. He must, he's telling the truth or he's just telling the lie. I believe the word of God is truth for all of us. He became poor that you through his poverty might become rich. 1 Corinthians 4, 8, it says, you are already full. You are already rich. You have reigns as kings. I love this word of God. You are already full. You're complete. There's nothing missing. There's nothing lacking for you. You are full and you are already rich. Ephesians 1, 17, 19. Paul was praying to the Ephesians. And it says here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation of the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? The riches of the glory of his inheritance. You know, Paul's prayer is that we live this Christian life. As, as we live this Christian life, we need to dig into the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to, to lead and guide us. And that we will be abundantly, abundantly blessed, that our eyes will be opened, that we can clearly see and understand, our eyes being enlightened, understanding the riches that God, that God has for His people. I, I like the, the, the story in the book of Judges 6, 11 to 16, 
when uh, uh, the story of um, uh, Gideon against the Midianites, and he was there um, uh, threshing wheat in a wine press. He was doing it at night because he was afraid. And the angel of the Lord visited him and said, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, the Lord was, the Lord is with you. And he was shocked. You see, he's, he's seeing himself different from how God sees him. And, and he said, if God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all these wonders and, and, and those wonderful miracles that God did? But now the Lord has abandoned and given us into the hand of Midianites. You know, the Lord turned to him and said, Go into, into, thy, into your strength. Whatever we know and understand in the word of God, when we go out in faith, that will be a wisdom. That will be our strength. Another story the book of, in, the, in the book of Genesis 21, verses 8 to 19, the story of Hagar and Ishmael being sent away by, uh, from the presence of Abraham and Sarah. And they started their journey in the wilderness and uh, the point that water was gone and she put the boy, the boy under one of the bushes. And she went off and sat down somewhere and started to cry. And the boy started to cry and God heard the cry of the boy and said, God called Hagar and spoke to Hagar and said, do not be afraid, God has heard the boy the cry of the boy. And in verse 18, in Genesis 21, it says that God made a promise that God will make Ishmael the great nation, which is the Arab nation. In verse 19, it's so, so amazing. It says, then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. God opened her eyes and she saw the well of water. The well of water was there. She didn't know it. But God had to open her eyes. And sometimes that's what we need to do. And that's the prayer of Paul. That our eyes will be open so that we can see what God has for us. Let me share with you a story. I'd like to close on this one. There's a story of a place called Iron West, Texas. Or commonly called Yates Pool. It is the story of Ira and Ann Yates. And during the time of depression in the late 1920s, the place was a sheep, a a farm, a ranch, owned by Ira and Ann Yates. And during those times, Mr. Yates Yates was doing it tough and was not able to make money, enough money, to cover all the ongoing costs and also to to run the, the, the ranch and also to... Uh, pay for the mortgage. He was in danger of losing his ranch. He was in danger of losing his entire livelihood. With just a little sum of money to meet the daily needs, they were able to survive with the help also with the government support. And day after day, as you looked at his family, his farm, his ranch, his sheep, a real sense of depression, started to kick in. He wondered how he would be able to survive and to pay his bills. But one day, out of nowhere, a group of engineers approached him. A group of engineers from an oil company came to him and said, Mr. Yates, there might be a possible oil deposit on your land. Would you be able to make a business with us and and he signed a contract, and they began putting up a rig and started drilling. For days and weeks, they kept drilling and drilling and drilling. And at 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. For days and weeks, there's nothing. You know, the first well came, came in and started producing 80,000 barrels of oil a day. And they started drilling wells one after the other. And the succeeding wells were pumped 
at 125,000 barrels of oil a day. Yates Pool, owned by Ira and Ann Yates, was able to produce more than a, a billion barrels of oil. His entire earning in today's currency would be more than 100 billion, and he could be considered as one of the, the wealthiest men who ever lived on the planet Earth. Mr. Yates did not know about it. He was looking on the surface, and what he saw was problem after problem after problem. Well, it was a great depression. He didn't know anything about the oil. He was looking on the surface. Little did he know that there was an exhaustible wealth, riches, and provision underneath him. The day he purchased the land, he had received the oil and mineral rights. Yet he'd been living on relief, just trying to make ends meet. He was a multi-billionaire living in depression and in poverty. The whole place was eventually called Iron Te West Texas after the name of Ira and Ann Yates who were the owners of this gigantic oil field. The Great Depression became days of celebration for Ira and Ann Yates. Friends, an amazing story that speaks so much of our riches that are hidden in Christ. You have treasures. The Bible says you have treasures in that earthen vessel. The Bible so clearly says that those who will believe as what the Scripture says from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Friends, this morning I'm so privileged to stand before the presence of this rich people. Yes, that person sitting next to you. 2 Peter 1, 3, 1, 3, 1, 3 says, Through His divine power, God has given us all things we need pertaining to this life and godliness. Friends, there is this, there is this unending resource within us. Let me remind you again the Word of God as we draw to a close. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. He became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. Friends, when he was born, he was born in, manger, in a manger. He didn't even have a place to lean his head. And when he was buried, he was buried from a borrowed tomb. He became poor. That he might become rich. 1 Corinthians 4, 8, you are already full. You are already rich. Ephesians 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance to you and me as people of God. We all have this tremendous potential and we all have these blessed gifts. Do not let fear nor doubt rob you of your riches, of your inheritance. Remember who your dad is. Remember that you are in Christ and everything that is Christ's is yours. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Greg, for such a powerful and wonderful message. Um, before we finish off our service, we're going to sing one last song. So may I invite you all to stand as we sing.
joining us today. We hope you have a lovely week ahead. God bless and we'll see you next Sunday. Thanks for joining us today. Feel free to check out our website, adlakechristiancenter.com.au or our church app to find out more information about us, learn how to give online and all our upcoming events.